Okay, great. Uh, it's 12 o'clock. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to our second annual Black History Month Society Black History Month presentations. Uh, We're so glad to have you. Uh, let us get started. Uh, if you can please make sure that your mic and mics are muted. If you're not a presenter, if you can please um, turn off your video. Um, let me let me start by introducing. Leon, you're on mute. Okay, I somehow got muted. Hello, folks, and welcome to our second annual uh, Black History Month uh, presentation. We're so glad that you can join us. Uh, let's get started. Uh, please uh, make sure that your mic and videos are muted. I'll start by uh, a brief introduction. So I'm Leon Simeon. I'll be the facilitator for today's presentation. A bit about myself. I am a society unit director from the OPG local and I work in nuclear training. I'm also a board member, education and audit committee member and chair of the Coalition of Racialized Professionals. This presentation is brought to you by members of that committee. I use the pronouns he, him, his. I'm so excited. We have a great presentation. We have a great set of presentations for you today. So sit back and enjoy and let's all learn something new. Before we get started with our introductions and greetings, I'd like us all to take a moment to acknowledge the land that we are on. I'm having a problem advancing my slide. Okay, there we go. So our land, our indigenous uh, territory acknowledgement will be read by Erica Griffith uh, today. So Erica is a member of the society, is a society member and also a member of the Co society's coalition of racialized professionals. Erica works at Ontario Power Generation. Erica is an advisor in commercial slash regulatory for renewable generation and has been with OPG for 20 years. Erica has a bachelor's uh, of engineering degree from the University of Waterloo and also an MBA from Wilfrid Laurier. Erica is also an active member of OPG's EDNI group for racial equality. Now over to you, Erica. Thanks, Leon. This is our indigenous territory acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge this land on which the Society of United Professionals operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. As settlers, we're grateful for the opportunity to live and work here. And we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We also recognize the contributions of Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made, both in shaping and strengthening this country and this community, our province as a whole. Thank you, Erica. Merci, Nikwich. At this time, I would like to introduce our next um, presenter who would be uh, reading the African Ancestor Acknowledgement. This will be read by Lilia Schillingford. Lilia is a member of the Society Coalition of Racialized Professionals and works at the Ontario Energy Board Local. Lilia works as an advisor in corporate communications and has been with the, o with the OEB for 12 years. Welcome, Lilia, over to you. Thank you, Leon. We recognize that indigenous sovereignty is linked to our collective liberation. The advancement of indigenous sovereignty is deeply rooted to black liberation and we remain committed to fostering both. We acknowledge that many people of African descent who are not settlers, but whose ancestors were forcibly displaced as part of the transatlantic slave trade, fought against their will and made to work on these lands. We thank you and we honor you. And it's with great honor and gratitude that I honor those who have led lives of service, those who have stood up for social and economic justice, those who have sacrificed their lives for the sake of this day, and those who have confronted and destroyed oppressive practices 
and institutions and those who have set affirming and equitable examples for us all. You who have stood against economic exploitation, homophobia, racism, gender discrimination, religious bigotry and other oppressive forces, we stand on your sturdy, courageous shoulders and we thank you and we honor. Thank you very much, Lily. So today we are honored and privileged to have with us the president of the society and secretary treasurer of the IFPTE. At this time, I would like to call on Michelle Johnson, society's president, to bring us her greetings. Thanks. Over to you, Michelle. Thanks, Leon, and, and thank you for having me here today. I'm zooming in to this uh, session from the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation, and it's covered by the Upper Canada Tre Treaties, and my pronouns are she, her. Though the roots of Black History Month trace back to 1926 in the United States, it has only been formally recognized in Canada since 1995. While non-Black people in Canada have much to learn about centuries of anti-Black racism, from almost 200 years of slavery to the racist pol policing practices that continue today, Black History Month is about so much more than that. This is a month to commemorate, celebrate, and inspire with stories of Black achievement, resilience, and joy. Part of the systemic racism inflicted on Black communities is that the stories of Black achievement in every facet of Canadian life have been suppressed, ignored, or overlooked. From science and math, to arts and culture, to, as we'll learn today, our labor movement, we have much to celebrate about Black contributions to this country. On behalf of the society's leadership, I want to thank the Coalition of Racialized Professionals and today's panelists for what is sure to be an inspiring and educational event. And I wish everyone a happy Black History Month. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. Our next speaker is Gay Henson, Secretary Treasurer of our parent affiliate IFPTE. IFPTE represents over 80,000 members in Canada and the US and is based out of our international office in Washington, DC. Please help me welcome Madam Secretary Treasurer Gay Henson as she brings us greetings from the IFPTE. Over to you, Gay. Oh. Okay, I see. I got my mute off. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that, Leon. No problem. Um, hey, um, thank y'all for having me today. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I thank you for inviting me to give opening remarks to your lunch meeting honoring Black History Month. Um, on behalf of IPPE uh, throughout North America, I applaud the Society of, U of United Professionals Coalition of Racialized Professionals for not only your great work within your union, but for also bringing awareness to other union brothers and sisters about the unique issues facing uh, racialized professionals in the workplace and also within our larger society. Today's lunch is to honor Black History Month, but pay tribute and proper recognition to the immense struggles and the many accomplishments and contributions that black and brown workers have brought to our communities and our nation. IFPTE is proud to recognize trailblazing black workers each month in our weekly recap, including incredible cutting edge work of all of our members in areas such as science, technology, and engineering. Um, I just got through last night looking at the FLCIO, I don't know if you can see this website, here in the, in the United States. And they have a really great, if you have a chance to look at it, it'd be great to, to go there. Uh, on their blog, they have uh, a six activist women you need to know about for Black History Month. And it was, I found it very intriguing. It's really great. Um, we in the labor movement need to continue to stand strong for justice for all people. And Black history is obviously a major part of that mission. Your lunch today is geared towards this go and of bringing awareness during this important month. And IPT thanks you for doing this. We thank you, Leon, for all the work you've done, put together, and all the folks that are working behind the scenes to put things together for this. I'm getting excited about it, the next hour, what it's gonna be like. 
Uh, I wish you all a successful and fruitful event today, and I celebrate you. So awesome. thank you for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Gay. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the following individuals who have been part of our Black History Month uh, 2022 team. So we have a, a number of members from the OEB, Lilia, uh, Sharita, uh, Kofi from NWMO Local, Noemi, Tanya, Erica, Adam, and Chris from the Society. We're so grateful that you were able to be part of this um, incredible uh, month's uh, presentation. So before I get started, uh, just a couple of ground rules. I talked about uh, making sure that you're muted. Uh, if you're not a presenter, please turn off your mic. We encourage you to use the chat. Um, tell us what you know, you're thinking, your reactions. Um, if you are an elected reps, uh, I know there's, there's probably lots of elected uh, society reps uh, on here. So if you can state your position, who you are and uh, which local you're from in the chat, that would be great. And then at the end, uh, following our closing, we'll, uh, if, we, if time permitting, we'll uh, use the chat for any question and answer. Okay. So as far as our presentation goes, um, I'm gonna start off with uh, a few slides on black labor leaders. I think it's really important that we uh, look to some of the great black leaders in Canada that we've had from the past and also some of the current ones that we have. This will be followed by a black history timeline by Noemi, followed by a presentation, family history presentation from Tanya. And then we'll have a presentation regarding black health and wellness from Sharita and Lily. Okay, so let's have some fun. Uh, as you know, I work in training and I always like to start things off with a little bit of trivia. I'm a, I'm a trivia um, geek. So I'm gonna read a couple of questions and I'd like you to respond via the chat. So the first correct answer will be awarded a prize. So I have two questions. I think the, um, one should be easy and then the other one maybe not so easy. So let's get started. Trivia question number one, black Canadian workers were once barred from joining the unions in Canada. Is that true or false? Any correct answers, Chris? A whole bunch. Okay, um, I'm sure. The looks like the first one. Now, we wanted the full true, right? Not just the letter T. Um, well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> well, Judith, congratulations. You're the winner. You're the first one in with true. Awesome, Judith. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that, um, that point in my presentation. Okay, trivia question number two. This black Canadian civil rights and labor activist is best known for what's called the Dr uh, Dresden experiment, which was a number of restaurant sittings in the 1950s. He is also remembered by an annual gala through the Toronto York Labor Council. We already have answers, Leon. <laughs> oh, that is really quick. I didn't even get to hear the music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the answer, Vicky was the first one in with Bromley Armstrong, but she, she, she missed the L in his name and got a semicolon. Oh. But then Sharon got in. Uh, Sharon Simpson from LCS got in with Bromley Armstrong. So I don't know. Maybe we can give them both a prize. We'll give them both a prize. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm good with that. I'm not a good speller myself. So Vicky, <laughs> you're, you're in it. So that completes our trivia questions for today. Okay, so today I'd like to talk about, it would be quite fitting, like we're, we're all part of the society of, um, we're all part of a union. And I think oftentimes we, we do miss the fact that uh, we did have some great black leaders um, in the labor movement that are often forgotten. So the partnership between workers of color and unions, in fact, reaches way back into history. 
So did you know that in 1917, the Order of Sleeping Car Porters became the first black union in North America? And so the first trivia question was that, you know, these workers were once barred from joining uh, the union, the railway union. And so they decided to, to form their own unions. And so in a matter of two years, they were able to negotiate two contracts, which in fact benefit not just the black workers, but, all, but also all railway workers. And so after two years, they were accepted into the broader uh, railway workers union. In fact, their work uh, left a lasting impact on equal rights throughout the labor history. And just as a footnote, this organization was formed 10 years before a similar one was formed in the United States. Their work, their work crossed borders. They formed affiliations with other unions in the United States and a lot of parallel celebrations in Canada and the US took roots in Canada. Um, this group later became known as the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Uh, the next uh, great uh, union leader uh, that I'd like to mention is Stanley G. Grizzly. He was the president of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters for 16 years. And he also became an uh, Ontario labor minister and a citizenship court judge. He wrote a great book called My Name Is Not George. And there's a great story behind this. You know, he said that one of his great achievements was ensuring that the black porters had name tags because in the past they were strictly called George or boy. And so he got them name tags. And so he wrote this book that's called My Name Is Not George. In fact, there's a park in Toronto named after Stanley Grizzly uh, to, in his honor. The next great labor leader is Bromley Armstrong and he was mentioned in our trivia question today. He was a Canadian civil rights leader and labor activist. He was a member of the United Auto Workers and he's famously known as the Dresden Experiment. So in 1954, there was a National Unity Association sit in, in restaurants, uh, basically to call out uh, restaurant owners who were refusing to serve black citizens, similar to what occurred in the United States. Next is Dr. Lynn Jones. And she's from Toro, Nova Scotia. And I know Tanya, you'd be happy to, uh, to know that she's a fellow Nova Scotian. In 1992, she became the vice president of the Canadian Labour Congress. So the COC represents 3 million workers in Canada and it was a great accomplishment for her. She received the Queen's Medal, was on many anti-racism task force and was a member of PSAC. And the last member I'd like to mention here is Fred Opshaw. He was a president of the Ontario Public Service Employees, OPSI. Uh, he was the pla first black leader of a major Canadian trade union. He won many wage increases in human rights language that are now embedded in OPSI contracts. There are so many more to mention and what I will be doing uh, in the next couple of years is to highlight some of the other um, great uh, past uh, black labor activists and civil rights uh, leaders. So that was a past. So here is the present. So we have some great present black leaders in the Canadian labor movement. And I really would like to say their names and acknowledge them. So the first person is Larry Rousseau, uh, Rousseau with the Canadian Labor Congress. He's the executive vice president. And I believe this is the second term. He was reelected for another three year term. And the CLC represents over 3 million union members across Canada, and he is based uh, in Ottawa. Next is Ahmed Gayed, Ontario Federation of Labor. He's a secretary treasurer, and the OFL represents over 1 million members in Ontario. We have Andrea Babington. She was recently elected as the president of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council. It's the largest labor council in Ontario and represents over 220 union members. Jan Simpson, president of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, the first black uh, woman to lead a major union. She was elected in 2019 and represents over 50,000 workers throughout Canada. 
And the the, uh, the last individual here, I'm really excited. I actually know him is Marvin Alfred. He's a president of the Toronto Transit Workers Union, known as the ATU, and he was recently elected in 2021. So please help us recognize these great Black Canadian labor unions, all fighting for everyone's uh, rights. Okay. So at this time, I would like to call upon our first presenter, Noemi Duvivier. Noemi is a society member in the OPG local. Noemi is a senior technical engineer in nuclear safety and technology department and has been with OPG for five years. Noemi is very active with the EDNI committees and chairs the committee for nuclear support. She has also recently been selected as a co-chair for OPG's employee research group known as the Group for Racial Equality. Please help me welcome Noemi. Over to you, Noemi. Thank you, Leon. Uh, I believe you will have to unshare your screen before I can share mine. Okay, thank you very much. I just want to make sure everybody can see my screen. We can't see the full screen. Um, no, I mean? That's great. Okay, so I will talk about uh, the notable black figures. Uh, black oh, sorry, figures. Um, we can't see the full screen. I can only see part of it. Um, would you be able to expand it? Oh, there we go. That's that's great. You can see it now. Yeah. So um, before I talk about uh, the notable um, Canadian black figures, I would like to talk a little bit about Black History Month and how it started. Um, it started in the United States, uh, but at the time it was only a week and it was um, recognized as Negro History Week. It started in February, 1926, and um, it was led by uh, African-American scholar, Dr. Carter G. Woodson. And at the time, what he, he was trying to do, like his goal, it was to raise the awareness and also the understanding in the school curriculum of African experience around the world. And uh, right now, um, other countries around the world, and including Canada and the UK, uh, devote a whole month to celebrating um, Black history. Uh, when it comes to, ca to uh, the Black history in Canada, um, in 1979, in Toronto, uh, became the first municipality in Canada to proclaim Black History Month. And this was done through the efforts of many individuals and organizations such as the Ontario Black History Society. Um, and then in, in Canada, in 1995, the Toronto area MP, Jean Augustine, introduced a motion that was passed unanimously by the House of Commons. And, to, and this was to recognize Black History Month across Canada. Uh, right now, what I'll do is that I'll go over um, the next, uh, 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 like uh, key milestones in Canadian Black history. So in 1608, um, the first Black person taught to have set foot on Canadian soil was uh, Mathieu da Costa. He was a free man at the, and, uh, and he was hired by a European to act as a translator. Um, in 1866, uh, Milton Gibbs became the first Black politician in Canada. He was elected to the Victoria Town Council. Um, after that, in 1861, Anderson Abbott became Canada's first Black physician. He served as one of only eight Black surgeons in the Union Army during the American Civil War. And then he was distinguished by being appointed aide de camp at the New York Commanding Officers Department in 1982. And uh, this recognition is the highest uh, military honor to, to be given at that time um, to a black person in North America. Uh, we have also to recognize in, in 1914, uh, black Canadians were on the um, front in World War I. Um, they were uh, involved um, 
with volunteering in hospital, working in factories, and also uh, some of the Black Association raised fund for the war. In 1944, the Ontario passed um, the uh, Racial Discrimination Act. In 1958, um, hockey player Willie Urry has his NHL debut with the Boston Bruins and is the first Black person to join the NHL. 1963, Leonard Braithwaite be became the first African Canadian in a provincial legislature, and he was elected as a liberal member for Etobicoke in 1963. Um, in 1995, Donovan Bailey assumed the title of world fastest human by winning the 100 meter sprint at the World Track Championship in Sweden. Um, in 2005, uh, Prime Minister Paul Martin uh, announced the appointment of uh, Michael Jean as Governor General. And in 2018, um, Vala Desmond's uh, $10 bill enters the, the enter circulation. So I'll talk a little bit more about Vala Desmond here. Um, she was born in, um, on July 6, 1914. And um, she was a businesswoman, a civil uh, libertarian, uh, born in Halifax in Nova Scotia. After a 1946 incident in which Desmond was arrested for sitting in a whites-only section of a theater in New Glasgow, uh, in Nova Scotia, she felt a, a conviction of defrauding the government of uh, the difference in tax that was one set at the time between the tickets in the racially separated sections. Though the conviction was upheld, she, you know, her struggle became a catalyst for change, and this is one of, and this is why she's uh, on our ten dollar bill. Um, another, um, another notable figure in arts and humanity is Austin Clark. He was born on July 6, nineteen thirty-four. He's a novelist, short story writer, and, and journalist. He was born in Saint James, Barbados. Uh, his book, uh, The Polished Hole which was published in 2002, was awarded the prestigious, the prestigious um, Giller Prize for Fiction, the 16th Annual Treason Prize, the Commonwealth Writer's Best Book Award for Canada and the Caribbean region, and also the Commonwealth Writer's Award for Best Book. Now I'm going to talk about two um, notable figures in politics. Um, I will talk about uh, Lincoln Alexander. He was born on January 21st, 1922. He became the first Black Canadian member of parliament in 1968, then became a cabinet minister in 1979, and then he became Ontario Lieutenant Governor in 1985. And in recognition for his many important accomplishments, Gen January 21st is being celebrated as Lincoln Alexander Day across Canada since 2015. Uh, another notable figure in politics is Anne Coles. She was born on August 12, 1943. And in 1984, she became the first black person appointed to the Senate in Canada. Also, we need to, to, to recognize that uh, Anne Coles founded Women in Transition, it was one of Canada's first shelters for female victim of violence. Um, I'm gonna talk also about two notable figures in science and technology. Uh, the first one is Elijah McCoy. He was born on May 2nd, 1843. And uh, as a mechanic in the 1870s, Elijah McCoy noticed that the, the machines had to stop every time they needed oil. And at the time, Mr. McCord invented a device to oil machinery while it was working. And soon no engine or machine was completed until it had a McCoy lubricator. Uh, now, um, well, the last person I'm gonna talk about is Charles Lightfoot Roman. He was born on May 19, 1889. Um, he was a, a, a doctor, surgeon, author, researcher, and lecturer. And he was also one of the first Black Canadians to graduate from McGill University's uh, Faculty of Medicine. He also became a recognized expert in industrial medicine. 
Um, he was the only known black person to serve with the Canadian General Hospital number three at the time, uh, which is part of the McGill, McGill University uh, network right now. Um, and this concludes my presentation. Uh, back to you, Lord, uh, Leon. I guess I will have to unshare my screen. Great. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, Nomi, for that um, wonderful timeline. I know it's not um, it's not everything, but you've uh, selected uh, some very important uh, figures to talk about. So our next uh, presenter is uh, Tanya Butt. Tanya is a member of the Power Workers Union and works at OPG as an office support rep. Tanya is part of the Emergency Services and Training Group in Nuclear, working directly for the Security Clearance Office and has been with OPG for 15 years. Tanya's recent achievements, including learn to, learning how to play the ukulele and solving the Rubik's uh, Cube. Please help me welcome Tanya. Over to you. Thank you, Leon. So I'm just going to share my screen with you here. Leon, may I have you uh, disconnect so I can share my screen? Are you disconnected? I believe so. Okay. If you can see that there. Yeah, we yeah, can that's see. That's great, we can see it. Okay, great. So my story is taking place in Nova Scotia where I was born and raised. Um, I'm a very proud Nova Scotian, as you may have heard already. Uh, but before I start my presentation, I just wanted to give you a little history of the black migration in Nova Scotia. Um, I myself was pretty surprised to learn this because I have to admit, I didn't really know the history until I investigated a little bit back into my family history to see how we all arrived in Nova Scotia. So to start, as mentioned before, um, the first black person in Nova Scotia was Matthew de Costa, and he was a pre-African who was a translator for the French explorers. Africans were brought as enslaved people from the British and the French colonies in the 17th and 18th century. Between 1782 and 1785, roughly 3,500 African Americans were resettled in Nova Scotia after the American Revolution. They were known as Black Loyalists. In 19, or 1796, the Maroons excelled from Jamaica and arrived in the Maritimes. And in 1813 to 1815, roughly 2,000 US Blacks settled in the Maritimes after the War of 1812. So that will just give you the basic history of uh, Blacks arriving to Nova Scotia. The story I'm sharing with you today is about my great granddad, John Robert Pinnell, who is the first of four generations in Canada. He was born in 1898 in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, the youngest of five children. His father was a slave in the US who escaped and arrived in Canada through the Underground Railroad and settled in Nova Scotia. And just to give you um, a rough idea of how it was in Nova Scotia at the time that my grandfather grew up, there is a story of a 12 year old black girl who went into a store and stole a piece of ribbon. And for punishment of stealing that ribbon, she received 12 lashes. So I just wanna give you the realization of how life was back then. So for my great granddad, he was born in um, 1898, or sorry, in, um, he went to school until he was in grade five he did the odd jobs as a teenager until the outbreak of World War I. He and his brother wanted to sign up for the war, but back then Blacks were not allowed to join the army. So then the British finally allowed an all Black battalion, formerly called um, the Number Two Construction. It was Canada's first and only Black battalion. Blacks were not allowed to sign their name when they registered. So my grandfather actually had to sign an X for his name. My great granddad's older brother, Chester, was a private in the battalion. Sadly, he passed away from the war from pneumonia and he was laid to rest in England. My great granddad enlisted as a merchant marine and he served for two years in the war before being injured and brought home. So when my granddad returned from the ships, 
he found a job with Imperial Oil as a delivery driver. He was the first employee at Imperial Oil. He stated that he was the first because he wasn't afraid to ask for a job. On December 6, 1917, my great granddad was given his delivery route for the day to Africville, which is located near the Bedford Basin. However, he asked the foreman if he could change his route that day to deliver to downtown Halifax instead. That request was granted. That was also the day of the Halifax explosion. My great granddad survived because he changed his route that day. The man who covered his route to Africville was never seen again. He recalled the sound of the explosion that day, stating that it was very similar to being back in the war when the Germans bombed a place called Black Wall Tunnel in London, England. My great granddad helped to recover the bodies from the health ex explosion that day. He also grabbed a hose and helped put out various fires. He was very grateful to be alive. My great granddad left Imperial Oil due to a conflict with his white co-workers who wanted to strike. My granddad wanted to work, not strike, but he also knew that if he didn't go along with them, as the only black man, his life would be difficult. He didn't want any trouble, so he chose to leave. He found a job with CN Rail as a porter. He said that during those times, it wasn't easy for a black man to get work, but CN Rail treated him like royal. He traveled all over Canada and met the greatest businessmen and women in the world, including the Prince of Wales and John Labatt of Labatt's Al. My great granddad retired with a full pension after 43 years of service. Throughout his life, he was a member of the Equity Lodge, a past master and grand steward. He was also a member of the oldest Masonic order of black men in Nova Scotia for some 30 years. He was an avid sportsman who played hockey, baseball, football, and cricket. He raised a family of three with his, life, his wife, Flory Adams, who was a sixth generation Nova Scotian. He was also a deacon for 25 years at the Cornwallis Street Baptist Church, a church that was established by black refugees in 1832. I had the honor of knowing my great granddad in his younger years. He was a fine dressed man who wore classy dress suits and the finest top hats. I remember stopping by his house one day after school and he was in the kitchen baking gingerbread and drinking Pepsi because he loved Pepsi. That's all he ever drank. <laughs> His face would light up when he smiled. And it was just always so nice to be around him and learn his stories about his life. He passed away when he was 93 years old. I am happy to say that my great granddad is honored in the black history books in Nova Scotia. I was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia in the largest black community located in the city's North End. We were not rich, but wealthy in spirit. If you needed help, the community would always chip in. It was a place where everyone knew each other. Your parents' friends became your aunts and uncles. And sadly, those same aunts and uncles would rat you out if you did something wrong. <laughs> Our community also included the families from Africville. Africville was an area of land given to black settlers in 1848, located on the outskirts of Halifax. It had no public transportation, no street lights or paved roads, no clean water, no garbage disposal or proper sewage. Still, the people of Africville paid their taxes and took pride in their homes. In 1964, the city of Halifax forced those families from their own homes and relocated them to other areas. One of those locations was called Uniac Square in the city's North End my community where I grew up. I grew up with those families from Africville and I still hold great friendships with them today. We are truly one big family and that is for life. That won't change. We're still there supporting each other today. Despite some of the negatives, we had our own heroes, strong leaders who worked in our community and made a difference in our schools. Halifax was also filled with a lot of black talent, singers, musicians, politicians, and athletes. 
some you already heard about. The others may include members of my family, which I'll share with you today. Bucky Adams, one of Canada's finest jazz saxophonists. At age 11, he played for the Queen during a royal visit to Halifax. He also played alongside many famous artists, including Louis Armstrong, Oscar Peterson, and B.B. King. Wayne Adams was the first Black Canadian member of the Nova Scotia House of Assembly and Cabinet Minister. He was made a member of the Order of Canada and received the Order of Nova Scotia. His accomplishments also include the development of Canada's first solid waste management strategy. Some of you may be very familiar with my next cousin, Tyrone Williams. He was a wide receiver for the NFL. He's the first player to win a Vanier Cup, a Super Bowl, and a Grey Cup. And I've had the luxury of knowing Tyrone quite well through my youth, and I got to wear his Super Bowl rings very, like, briefly, <laughs> but they were beautiful. And it's just still a proud moment for us in Nova Scotia. I just saw something go out to honor him again. It's just, it was a proud moment for us to have him because he just did so well in his career. And last but not least is my cousin Andre Wright, who was internationally known as a biologist and who just recently became the Dean of Washington State for the University of Agriculture, Human and Natural Resources of Science. So the Black community that I grew up in, it doesn't exist today. As Halifax expands and develops, the buildings in its history are slowly being erased. Affordable, affordable housing is limited, forcing a lot of Blacks and white families to move further out of the city, losing family homes they had for generations. Thankfully, there are people and politicians working together to stop this gentrification. But it is sad as a person from Nova Scotia to go back today and walk down the streets with my children and have nothing to show them. It literally is being erased right before our very eyes. So I'm doing my part today by sharing this story with you, but I do encourage you to read more about Nova Scotia's Black history. There's so much to learn and there are so many proud people from Nova Scotia that I would love for you to learn about. So thank you for joining my presentation and I'll throw it back to you, Leon. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Tanya, for sharing that uh, rich family history with us. Um, I've heard this a second time and I, I'm always uh, in, in amazement and awe. So for our, our next speakers, uh, Sharita and Lillian will be sharing with us a bit about Black health and wellness. Sharita Walder is a member of the Society of Co Coalition of Racialized Professionals and works at the Ontario Energy Board Local. Sharita works as an advisor and has been with the OEB for six years. Sharita indicated that she's also a proud owner of a 12-year-old Shizutsi. Please help me welcome Sharita Walter and Lilia Schoenford, who we've already met. Over to you. Thank you, Leon. Uh, Sharita and I will be sharing with you about mental health matters, um, African-centered wellness and self-care. And we chose this topic because in Black History Month, not only are we highlighting valuable contributions, but we're also highlighting and spotlighting emerging issues and, and challenges that the Black community has so that together um, we can solve them. And also through this presentation, we'll be sharing um, some of the gifts that were passed down to us from our ancestors. Um, I passed it on to Sharita to do the first part and then I'll follow to do the second. Thanks very much, Lilia, and thanks, Leon. I am the, um, I'm the proud over owner of a 12, 12-year-old 12 Shih Tzu. So my little dog is right here, just in case anyone's mm -hmm. wondering. <laughs> um, so Toronto's Black community face a far greater risk of having serious mental health problems compared to the majority of the population. So um, the first mental health study of black communities in Canada, it found that nearly two thirds of black Canadians display severe depressive symptoms. 
And there were higher rates among women and those who are employed and those born in Canada. So rates of depressive symptoms among black individuals are nearly six times the 12 month prevalence reported for the general population in Canada. And these findings are consistent with earlier studies in the States and this suggests that Canadian colorblind policies may inadvertently reinforce racial discrimination and that has detrimental effects to mental health. So studies show that witnessing or being the target of anti-Black racism throughout your lifespan can have adverse effects on mental health and physical well-being. Black Torontonians frequently experience undue mistrust and scrutiny as part of daily life in workplaces, in schools, in public spaces or during interactions with public institutions. For African, Caribbean and Black Canadians, the struggle for mental health is often a silent one. There are misunderstandings within the community around what mental illness means and barriers that prevent individuals from accessing help or safe spaces. There are many impacts of anti-Black racism on mental health. Um, there's racial trauma when an individual experiences the trauma themselves. There's secondary trauma. It's exposure through a firsthand account or a narrative. There's post-traumatic stress disorder, usually associated with a shocking or dangerous event. There's intergenerational trauma. So trauma that gets passed down from those who directly experienced an incident to subsequent generations. There's racial battle fatigue. And that's the cumulative result of race-related stress response to distressing mental and emotional conditions. It's caused by constantly facing racially dismissive, demeaning, insensitive, and hostile racial environments and individuals. There's hypervigilance, hyper the elevated state of constantly assessing potential threats around you. Adverse childhood experiences, so that could be a childhood event that where the health risk um, occurs across the lifespan of the individual and um, internalize negative beliefs. One starts to believe that the inferiority imposed on them is true um, and internalize stigma, the process where a person um, cognitively or emotionally absorbs negative messages or stereotypes and comes to believe them and apply them to him or herself. So the impact results in um, anxiety, stress, stress-related illnesses such as high blood pressure, heart disease, and nervous system problems, uh, depression, suicide, damaged self-esteem, addiction, violence, low productivity, and feelings of inferiority, to name a few. So the 10 biggest barriers to Black mental health, the high cost, familial shame, cultural stigma, um, the lack of diversity in healthcare, poor competency among non-Black clinicians, whiteness as a foundation to mental health care, distrust of the medical industry, difficulty navigating the process, emotional hesitation, and negative past experiences. And I'll turn it over to Lilia. Thanks, Rita. Black people by nature um, are very resilient. Um, and as the stories that were shared with you earlier um, about the different uh, microaggressions and systemic barriers that Michelle Johnson talked about and was talked about in previous presentations, um, Black people have had to um, sort of look at ways where they can continue to build their resilience as systemic barriers continue to be perpetrated against them in all different walks of life. So in the next slide, um, some of the symptoms sort of creep up on you, um, whether it be through all the stresses, the additional stresses of the isms, change in appetite, emotional, physical exhaustion, feelings of wanting to hurt yourself, getting sick more often, changes in sleep patterns. And a lot of times studies show us that 
when someone of African descent goes to um, a hospital or a clinician to seek care, their issues and challenges are not taken as seriously as those of their counterparts. In the next slide, Shrita. In the next slide, it shows through the slave, um, the slave process of taking Africans that were skilled um, out to all different places of the world. Um, it gives a sort of a, a picture, a graphical picture of the thousands and millions of people that were taken out of Africa and displaced in different areas of the world. What happened, um, as you'll see from the next slide, is that as Africans moved from different um, different parts of Africa to the new places that they were displaced into, they took with them the folklore, their language, their values, their music, their resilience, their spiritual practices and rituals and expressions. Um, and also one of the things that they took with them was medicine. Um, through the transatlantic slave period, um, we weren't able to read, we weren't able to write. So most of the information that was shared about taking care of ourselves and self-care was done orally. In the next slide, um, you will see that um, African people all over the world, or people of African descent, whether or not they're currently living on the continent, they've immigrated to different parts of the world, or they were displaced to a different part of the world, spirituality is a huge part of who we are. And there's no separation between what we see as the spirit world and a, a strong belief in faith and um, our everyday lives. So in the next slide, there's a saying that says Sankofa um, is an Adinkra symbol from West Africa. And it means to, if you see the symbol, it's a symbolic bird with its head turned back. And which means that we're going back into history and pulling on what we've forgotten and bringing it forth to our current, our current um, existence. And Sankofa is of particular importance because it reminds us to do just that. And in the next slide, um, one of the things that we practice as people of African descent um, was mindfulness. And the mindfulness, it reduces stress, reduces anxiety, Heights depression, reduces confusion, helps us focus more, improves our quality of sleep, our memory, our um, attentive skills. As well, it even provides us a way of taking better care of ourselves. Um, as part of um, African-centered healing rituals um, from the Caribbean, from the continent, Brazil, and other parts of the world, um, the different rituals that we do. And a lot of times um, rituals are sort of stigmatized as something evil, but a ritual is something that you make into a habit, something that you do on a continuous basis. Um, so in order to take care of ourselves, we have to make rituals, um, our self-care habits, ritualistic and practices that we do on an everyday um, and continuous basis. Um, in the next slide, one of the um, things that you know, we sort of remind people to do is ensure that self-care is an intentional thing that we do, that we take time and we make space to ensure that because of all the weight that we carry, through all the things that we've struggled through, and through all the things that our ancestral um, remembrance like in our DNA, we remember and we hold on to trauma and some of the things that um, we have to ensure is that we're very intentional in our self-care and that we ensure that we create safe environments to take care of ourselves and we seek out safe environments to take care of ourselves. And we also repeat these actions that we need to um, serve ourselves on a regular basis. So I'll share with you some practices. In the next slide,
Shall we that in the next slide? Have we lost Sharita? Okay. So in the next slide, we talk about verbalism as an act of resistance. I saw someone put the chat in the chat that they were listening to a, a presenter and that um, love and taking care of herself is an act of resistance and act of resilience. Um, so African traditional medicine is the oldest and perhaps the most assorted of all therapeutic systems. Um, in Africa, there was a lot of lush and green and our ancestors utilized every single plant. Um, maybe not every because some are poisonous, but utilized as many plants as they could get their hands on to ensure that we use them to heal, um, whether or not it was a bad stomach, whether or not it was a, um, a mental uh, or a psychological issue, maybe depression, um, maybe sores, or even some diseases like um, asthma and, um, you know, issues with, with, your, with your eyes and seeing and so forth. Um, and even one of the things that our ancestors knew was that herbal health was so important that when being stolen from Africa and being brought into the ships, women would braid their hair um, in different styles and plant seeds into their hair. So throughout the journey, they could have these healing seeds that they could plant to, make, to take care of themselves once they reached their final des destination. So there are herbs like parsley and basil and marjoram and flowers like rose and lavender and oils like frankincense and chamomile and spices like sea salt and citrus slices and cinnamon and even honey, which is not a plant, it's derived from the bees, but also honey was used in, st in stuff like teas and some of the herbs, next slide please. Some of the herbs could be used in teas and um, salves and so forth um, to, um, to ensure that um, they were being utilized for health purposes. And even herbs were used as, as baths to cleanse our energy and spirit. And when we look at sort of contemporary practices, you know, we hear about things like taking care of the chakra. Um, but our ancestors did these things way before they became um, you know, popular and, and quote unquote modern. Um, so if someone was feeling a certain ailment and needed to clear some of their chakras or kras as it's known in West Africa, they would um, take certain baths with certain herbs and certain herbs could either put you to sleep or certain herbs could make you um, feel more awake or remove some of the bad energy that you're feeling from you. So herbal baths are a major part of what we do and it's people from I'm from the Caribbean and I remember my grandmother, um, you know, at certain times of the year, she would say, it's time for your bath and she would put and boil all kinds of herbs and make sure that we bathe in them. I had no idea what we were doing and it was usually before we were sent off to school after the summer, but it was a way of, yeah, it's, it's some, Sharon said it's a Caribbean bush bath, but it was a way before the school um, time to sort of build up our immune system as well, when we were going into summer vacation, grandma would make us drink some teas and they would make us go to the bathroom. And that was a way of cleansing us from all the, um, you know, mangoes and all the fruits that we were eating, but also from all the unhealthy food. It was used as a toxin to detoxify our bodies. In the next slide, um, we, we, talk, we talk about, um, there's a slide that shows you how, uh, how to use herbal baths um, you know, mixing the water in a big pot and boiling them, cooling it, adding it to your tub and so forth. And this is stuff that you can read online to find out what herbs are good for what and so forth. Um, so for herbal tea rituals, um, and not only as people of African descent that were part of the um, Atlantic slave process. I call it the Mahafa, which is one of the worst things that happened in our history. Um, if, when it comes to herbal tea rituals, um, it's not only teas, it's also coffees. People of Ethiopian descent, they use um, coffee in their rituals as well. Um, so on the screen, you'll see some various teas that can be used um, for healing and for strengthening um, our immune system and stuff. There's also forms of meditation 
So tea can be used as um, a meditative um, tool as well. Um, and the benefits of it is to decrease stress and anxiety, um, increase calm and focus and so on. I realize that we're nearing the end of the day. Um, so Srita, if we could go to the next slide, I'll talk about a bit about meditation and meditation being used as a tool to release stress. And once you meditate, it actually lowers the stress hormones in the bloodstream, it decreases anxiety. It's really good practice for everyone to do, but particularly people of African descent. Um, some of the issues that we face is high blood pressure um, and diabetes and so forth. Meditation has a really powerful effect on stabilizing our, our, our systems um, and is a really beneficial health benefit. And there's several different types of meditation rituals. A lot of times we feel that we need to sit cross-legged, but we don't. We can either um, do moving meditation, prayer is a form of meditation, um, uh, visualization is a form of meditation as well. And in the next slide, um, one of the things that people of African descent are closely connected to is nature. And in nature, we can find um, grounding, connection with the trees, connection with what is called Asasiya, Mother Earth, by taking a walk in the woods, going and sitting by, you know, by water, um, heals us and helps us to release all the environmental and societal um, toxins that we leave, that, that is in our bodies. So I'll close here. Um, thank you, Sharita, for advancing the slides for me. And thank you for having Sharita and myself do this presentation. can't hear you, Leon. Yeah, somehow I got uh, I got kicked out. So uh, uh, thank you all for a wonderful Black History Month uh, presentation. I would like to thank all the presenters. Uh, thank you for uh, taking the time to put this together. It was really fantastic. I've, I've learned uh, so much uh, from this. And I'd like to leave you with, um, you know, as we all work together to advocate for an equitable post-pandemic re recovery, let us continue to reflect on the inequities of our past. As we do the critical work to combat anti-Black racism, let it also serve as a reminder that labor's resilience rests on the shoulders of giants and those who led various movements in the fight for social, social justice. 